Today's guest on the podcast is Katherine Hansen. She's the author of the book Brain Over Binge. I came across her book uh, a couple of months ago, I guess, and it was really life changing. Um, as someone who's recovered from alcohol addiction, I think food addiction is really closely related, but also difficult and different because you don't have to drink every day, but you do have to eat. So her work is really fantastic. She has a website, Brain Over Binge, and offers an ebook for free that you can sign up for her mailing list. She has online courses and another book, Brain Over Binge Recovery Guide. So this was a great episode just to chat about binge eating and, and sort of how to kind of get yourself out of that habit if it's something that you're dealing with. So I hope you all enjoy this episode with Katherine Hansen. Welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day, and it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. Welcome to another episode of the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Atwood. I'm super excited about today's guest. Katherine Hansen is here. Hi, Katherine. Hi, Meredith. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Super excited to talk with you because food and me go a long way back, <laughs> as does food and everyone, I suppose. But yeah. um, I came across your book. I'm not really sure how, but it was about six months ago, and I listened to it on Audible. And it was so fascinating and so life-changing for me in many ways. Um, so I, to give you a little background on me, I ha I'm a former alcohol addict, right? And so I'm mm -hmm. almost three years sober. And the way I came about sobriety was very similar to the way that you talk about recovery from binge eating, but I haven't quite applied those same principles to my eating. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it was really cool to, to read your book. So thank you for putting it out there. I think it's really life-changing for a lot of people. So well, let's you. talk a little bit about how you came to write Brain Over Binge and just a little bit of your background with, with your binge eating and, and sort of the process. Yeah, sure. It The book really came about for my own struggle. I mean, I remember when I was, I struggled with it strongly, like toward the end of high school, through college, after college. And remember just during my lowest time in college, I just told myself that if I ever found a way out of this, that I would write about it and I would write a book. And it just, when I recovered, it just felt like it wasn't even a choice. I had already made that decision and I just moved forward with it. And, you know, so it really was born out of that um, because in college and when I was really struggling with it, I tried sort of the traditional ways to recover, which kind of involved getting to the root of the problem, like psychologically, what, what are you trying to cope with emotionally? You're binging for sort of a deeper reason or because of issues from your past and all that stuff, you know, while I think it has value in like making you a better person in your life, like to, you know, become more whole or happy or find purpose or meaning or deal with your emotions and things like that all has meaning, but it just didn't help me with the binge eating specifically. So I didn't recover through kind of the traditional avenues that I mm -hmm. had been, you know, help, tried to receive help with when I was struggling. So when I did recover in sort of a non-traditional way, it, it just solidified that desire to share it because I felt like other people really needed to hear this message. So it really was about six months after I stopped binging that I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm done with this. Like I, I can never see myself ever going back. And I started just taking down notes and writing kind of early chapters and things. But it took a long time for the book to kind of come together. I mean, I started writing and then I had three kids. Well, the time when I published, <laughs> when I published the book, I had my third kid, like the same time I published the book. It was crazy. Um, That's a good time to do that kind of stuff. I mean, exactly. Really. <laughs> and then I had another kid after that. So it took, it took a long time for the book to kind of come together, but I just never let it go. And I just kept working on it, kept working on it. So I recovered in 05. I didn't actually publish the book till 2011. So wow. it was a pretty, you know, a long labor of love, I guess. Um, yeah. So how so, long did you actually, when did you realize you were, I guess, a binge eater? Was it, or is, was it from a young age? Have you always struggled with it? No, I was pretty normal. <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as growing up, like I ate normally, was really active, normal weight. Um, and so I was kind of like a skinny kid, but I just ate a lot of food and I was really active like, competitively in sports and stuff like that. It wasn't until high school, I actually had a tonsillectomy 
And at the time, I had been kind of steadily putting on weight, as girls do, like, at that age. It's just totally normal and part of just becoming a woman. And it coming from a background of, like, valuing athleticism and sports, and I think I had a very weight-conscious family, that it, it kind of concerned me that I was putting on weight, but I didn't actually do anything about it. And then mm-hmm. I had a tonsillectomy, and I lost weight, like, just because I couldn't eat for a little while. And I, I kind of just stuck with that. I was like, oh, this is a good solution for not gaining any more weight. I just won't eat. So I, st- I started, you know, that dieting that a lot of girls were doing at that age and just kind of fell into those behaviors and really took it too far. I became anorexic. I mean, I was severely underweight and my body reacted like you read about in the book. I'm sure like you're mm-hmm. it's that survival mechanism. Like We're not meant to starve ourselves. Our bodies have natural, um, you know, a way to kind of save us from that. So it wasn't that something was wrong with me. It was that I wasn't eating and my body just really encouraged me to eat. My cravings started increasing. I thought about food more than I had ever thought about in my life. Like the more I tried to control it, the more I wanted to eat until like one morning in high school, I wrote about in the book, I just ate like eight bowls of cereal in a row and I had never done that before. And it felt like a total out of body experience. I was like, Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what I was doing. It, It was just, I mean, to anyone who hasn't experienced a binge, it can be kind of hard to explain, but it's like, you just can't seem to stop yourself from eating. It's like this force kind of takes over you. And what I came to understand is that force was that primal force from my brain like I call it the lower brain in my book the the part of you that's just really trying to get you to survive and so that's kind of how it started and then I dieted more to try to compensate I really um, got into over exercising a lot to that was my form of purging and the cycle just kept repeating I would restrict exercise binge restrict exercise binge it was just became a very self-perpetuating cycle it turned into this terrible habit that just really consumed my life all because you know i i dieted i didn't eat enough yeah so that was really how it came about the interesting i love the eight bowls of cereal reference because (laughs) i i haven't quite had eight but i have been known to have six (laughs) yeah (laughs) and also a half gallon of ice cream so i i totally it's kind of I like reading about other people's binges because I'm like, oh, wow, that's impressive. And it's not, it's kind of like a sick, you know, but it's, it's, it's true. If you've never experienced um, being on that side of a binge, it is, it is absolutely insane. Like I always think, okay, I'm, I'm standing here in the pantry. I remember walking here and then I don't remember how long I've been standing here, but apparently there's a lot of food gone. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Yeah. And one of the things that I noticed in your book was the way that you would purge. Like I was, I have never been a purger, which, you know, I guess that's a good thing. I don't know, but your exercise was really, that's, that's kind of a purging that I think people don't consider when they hear bulimia. So Mm -hmm. how did, how extreme did you get with the exercising? It started with just maybe running a few extra miles. I was a competitive runner in high school. And like after that eight bowls of cereal, which during the course of my binge eating, that seemed really like a small amount of food compared to how my binges eventually became. But it started to become, you know, run a few extra miles. Like if I was going to run four miles to train for something, then I'd run seven or something like that. But then Mm -hmm. as the binges increased, I started adding time I mean in college the day after binges I would exercise for up to like seven up to seven or eight hours I mean it was a long 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 time I would bring like my books to study while I was writing the ellipticals and things like that I mean just I don't know it was part of the whole thing I just felt like it was such an out of out of body experience I mean, that's probably not the right way to put it but it just felt like something hijacked my brain and made me do something yeah. that I know I truly did not want to do and once that I was kind of back to my uh rational self was back I felt like I had to do something about it and like I'm not just gonna let this happen and not do anything about it and I try I did try to self-induce vomiting um basically maybe after like my third or fourth binge and it it just never worked for me and I'm glad it didn't because that is such a dangerous behavior I mean so is over exercising for sure but you know self-induced vomiting can have some a lot more serious medical consequences so I'm glad it never worked um but yeah exercise just became my kind of go-to for purging so let's talk about traditional paths for recovery for binge eating. I, I don't really know a lot about it, and I don't know if, if my audience does either. But what I gathered from your book is is traditional thought is sort of cognitive treatment that you've got something in your past that you're trying to or that you're reacting to, and that's why you're eating. I mean, is that kind of the basics of traditional recovery for binge eating is getting to the root of, of your past or un- unlocking some deep dark secret that's causing this behavior I think that's kind of how 
that's the basis of it. Now there are there have been improvements over time. I think now kind of the gold standard is, is your cogn- cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's really looking at the thoughts that are kind of leading up to it and trying to change your thoughts and change your beliefs. And this has value. And cognitive behavioral therapy is also um, looking at your eating. and But it still is... Um, Cognitive behavioral therapy also looks at the triggers, like what is happening in your life that's causing you to binge. And then, so you change the things in your life that are causing you to binge or what emotion is causing you to binge. So then you try to change that emotion or improve that emotion. What are you trying to cope with by binging? And you try to improve whatever you're trying to cope with, thinking that will somehow take away the binges. So that it's, it gives it a better framework, cognitive behavioral therapy, rather than just that psychoanalytic type Um, treatment where you're just digging into your past and trying to figure out the root cause and what psychological problems are leading into this and sort of that disease model. So this CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is an improvement um, to that, but it's still like blaming the binges on something either external in your circumstances, in your relationships, or something internal like your feelings, your emotions, you know, your thoughts, things like that. It's It's blaming the binges on other things. And then there's also the food addiction treatment, which is kind of maybe a little newer in that it's blaming it on the food. And again, that's something right. external. It's something, you know, if you ch- eat a certain way, then you won't binge. If you don't eat sugar, you won't binge. If you don't eat flour, you don't binge. And, you know, for various reasons, all I think all of those three methods can fall short. I mean, not that they don't work for people. They do. Um, you know, CBT can have, I think, up to like a 40 percent um, success rate in that it can reduce it in 40% of people. But psychoanalytic therapy, I've read a study that said only 4% like stop yeah, binging after a I certain, I mean, I'm not <laughs> like, I don't have the studies in front of me right now, but it, you know, their treatment for eating disorders leaves a lot to be improved. Right. Right. And the food addiction area is really interesting too, because while it makes total sense that no one's really going to go on a kale binge or really go wild on spinach salad, um, you know, living life is, really hard when you're just on kale (laughs) yeah i mean that just that whole theory assumes the other foods don't even exist but they exist and we see them every day and we have to be around them and so yeah it it doesn't really line up with reality i guess and it just i guess unnecessarily hard for people so what was sort of the turning point for you you said there was a point where you said enough i can't do this anymore what what was that binge like or what led up to it yeah i mean i feel like i said that a lot of a lot of times during yeah, the course well, that's but true. That's a lot of people it, yeah. can relate to yeah. every time you do it you think okay I'm never doing this again and then somehow you find yourself back there and it's right what really turned it around for me was a book that I read that I talked about in my own book called rational recovery and it actually talked about alcohol and drugs it was actually kind of a um it wasn't it was something not against I guess it was against AA it was it was an alternative to AA to Alcoholics mm-hmm. Anonymous just against the disease model really about kind of that personal responsibility and you get to choose whether or not you drink and it it was about alcoholism but everything in it just really spoke to me about my own problem it it really taught me that it wasn't about my other problems in my life it was about this behavior that i had created it wasn't my fault i mean i had created it through dieting and through my survival instincts but it perpetuated and you know, it wasn't about blaming myself, but it was about taking responsibility going forward in that I didn't have to solve everything else first. I had been working to try to correct all these things in my life, to try to fix all these, quote, triggers, these things that were causing me to binge, to try to fix all my feelings so that I wouldn't binge. And I was just going about it in all the wrong direction. I needed to really look at this behavior and what exactly was this behavior. And just it, it really helped me redefine why I was binging and then how to fix it. Um, Mm -hmm. I can kind of get into some of that here. What the author talked about was, he called it your beast brain and then your human brain. And it was Jack Trimpey who wrote this book and talked about how when there's addiction, the beast brain or the the animal brain, or I call it the lower brain in my book, it just like hijacks your higher brain and your higher thinking. And what recovery then becomes is about getting, learning to to recognize your addictive voice. He calls it your addictive voice. All the reasons that your lower brain kind of produces that gets you to do that harmful behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's not about fixing your life. It's about learning to recognize this voice of addiction and and separating from it and realizing that that primal brain that you have actually does not have control over your voluntary muscles. Like your, your human brain gets to decide whether or not you follow those, those primitive 
instinctual or habitual desires. So kind of about stopping believing it has anything to do with like who I was or who I wanted to be or my goals or anything that had happened in my life and starting to see that this was just this primal force inside my brain just doing what it thought I needed to do. It was like, a, it started as a survival instinct, but then it, it kind of kept kept going as a survival instinct in that once a habit's created, the primal brain thinks that you need to keep repeating it. So it really made binging seem like it was totally necessary. And in those moments, it was like, that's what I felt like I needed to do. And it wasn't that something was wrong with me. It was just I had this primal, um, I call it like a lower brain glitch. It's that yeah. you know, my brain made me think I needed something that I didn't need. So kind of, kind of just stepping back and becoming an observer of that and getting more in touch with my human brain and, and being able to just allow these desires to come and go without acting on them. And as I talked about in my book, like once you don't act on those desires, they go away. And that's all based on neuroplasticity and how the brain works and how the brain can change based on the actions we take or don't take. Um, whatever you don't use in the brain, you lose. So it just kind of became a matter of breaking the habit. And it sounds way too simple, but it's not as simple as it seems in that I wrote two books that are like 600 pages combined. <laughs> so people are like, are you just saying to stop the behavior? I'm like, yeah, but no. I There's mean, it takes a lot, a more, lot of yeah. background to explain it. Like, so It's true, though. It's true. And, you know, a lot of it, and I don't know if you, I don't remember if you talked about this, but I think where a lot of people can get stuck is where the beast brain and the human brain start to kind of cross over as far as the human brain adopts the story (laughs) of the beast brain. Like I'm always going to be overweight and, and overweight and binge I know are two different things, but like for me adopting kind of the story that I've always been overweight, I'm going to always be overweight than allowing that behavior to perpetuate it. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I definitely think there's there's a connection there too. And so you've got to kind of stop that story too. And that's where your human brain steps in as well, right? You got to start saying, this is not me. Yeah, definitely. To start to see those habitual thoughts that, you know, maybe served a purpose somewhere in the past or who knows how they even started, but now they, they keep just repeating themselves. Like a lot of our thoughts, we're not consciously thinking they just pop up because that they've always popped up and it doesn't mean we have to believe them that's been a big part of sort of my journey and getting away from binging but also has helped me in the rest of my life is just not believing everything that pops into your head and not feeling like you have to act on everything that pops into your head during the day Um, but as far as using it to specifically stop binging what I think the fundamental shift that I did was believing starting to believe that it was only the urges to binge that caused binging And like I talked about before, in therapy, it was all about the other things, the feelings, the thoughts, the emotions, the, you know, things, circumstances in your life. And that those caused binging. So you had to fix all that. Well, no, it was actually only that desire, only that primal desire, only that that urge that caused the binge. So I needed to learn to deal with the urge, not all those other things. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the the transformation took place. It simplified everything. I learned to observe the urges. I have kind of a five component process about separating from the urge, not reacting to it, not acting on it. And yeah, if you can just learn that the urge is any, any thought, any feeling, any physical sensation that makes you feel like you want to binge or that encourages a binge. So then you're talking about those other thoughts, like I'm always going to be overweight, any sort of self, self self-sabotaging thoughts. Well, if those thoughts are encouraging binging, then that's part of the urge. And you can learn Mm -hmm. to see all of that as not you. It's really interesting when you think about breaking it down into the beast brain and the human brain. I mean, we have that pretty much in every area of our life. I mean, at some point when someone makes us mad, we want to just pummel them or run them over in our car. And we don't because, you know, we've learned with the human brain, okay, I recognize this person really pissed me off, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, X, Y, and Z, I'm not going to run them over in my car. Um, so It's just really interesting that we have this sort of awareness in other areas of our life, right? But then these other ones, we kind of compartmentalize them because, and we just don't know what to do with it. But I think it's just really interesting that you can break it down to, no, it's the, the, the urge to binge is what is actually causing you to binge. And that, that is so simple, but really hard to kind of get going. So where do you, 
Where do you recommend someone start on this process? Obviously your, obviously, your book is a great starting point, but just from someone listening in their car right now who's dealing with you know, any addictive behavior, really, what, what is the first step? Yeah, I mean, I do think it can be different for each person, but I guess if you're asking me just for one, I would think just to develop an awareness of it. Like if you feel like you are hijacked, and we talked about earlier, like I felt like, an out-of-body experience, eating eight bowls of cereal. Well, there was something before that. Like there was a desire, there was an urge, there was something, there was thoughts, there was, you know, and that's all the urge and that's the cause. Like that was the cause. It wasn't the circumstances in my life. It wasn't, you know, it was that desire. And sure, I needed to eat more at the time. Like that, that's a huge part of it, which I'll get into later, but I didn't need to binge. So I would recommend just developing an awareness of what is happening for you in these moments leading up to it? What thoughts are you having? What what does your urges, what do your urges feel like? What do they sound like? What, what are the voices you're hearing? What are the thoughts you're hearing? Um, in developing that awareness, you can begin to then start separating from those thoughts or being able to devalue those thoughts. Um, you talked about like when we're mad at someone, we want to pummel them. And it the reason we don't is because we don't give those thoughts value. We just hear it oh, like, yeah, oh, I would yeah. love to pummel them. And we don't because... You know, but for some reason, we're giving these urge thoughts value. So learn to see in other areas of your life where you have kind of irrational thoughts that you would never act on. Yeah, you have thoughts all the time that you don't act on. So just learning to see these urge thoughts in the same way. And the first step of like not acting on them is just becoming aware of them. Yeah. Um, I will say just for listeners, you know, eating disorders do have definite physical medical consequences. So like a first step too, I think is just making sure that you're healthy. If you're purging, like making sure you're under medical supervision. I mean, even if you're not purging, like just that too, like taking care of your health is, is a right. huge, huge first step. And just to, to even make sure you're capable of handle of doing like a self recovery. So I, right. I would back up and say that's a first step. Yeah. But then once that's okay, the, the awareness is a really important piece. These are all of our proper disclaimers. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are making exactly. them. No, I know. Because I, I get to talking about alcohol recovery and stuff. And I'm like, oh, uh, I'm not a trained counselor. Please seek medical advice. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So, yeah, for sure. Um, it's interesting when I struggle with binging. You said to recognize, like, the thoughts and the urge. Mine is always I do not want to be – where I'm at right now, I do not want to feel this. I do not want to deal with this. Like that is what triggers mine. And I don't ever feel, it's almost like food is just to shut up my head. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? I mean, have you encountered that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a lot of um, binging almost, it doesn't even relieve any, okay, let me back up a little bit. You binge to cope with the urge to binge is something that I kind of came to as an insight. Like the urges make you feel so uncomfortable and like I have to do this, I have to get rid of this. Or even if you're thinking you have to get rid of some thought, like it makes you feel so uncomfortable that you almost binge just to make the urge go away. And that's like your primary relief that you get when you binge. People say, oh, I binge to get rid of feelings or emotions or whatever. But really, I think when you stop and look at it, it's to get rid of that urge. Because if you didn't have that urge the feelings wouldn't be as bothersome. And I think when people stop, when people do say, okay, I binge to to get rid of certain emotions or to kind of numb out, when you really look at the consequences of the binging and when you really look at what it's actually doing for you, it's not worth, you know, whatever kind of positive benefits you think you're getting, it's not worth it. Like it never actually fixes anything. It makes things worse. It doesn't solve any problems, you know, so that's kind of an illusion that it's helpful in some way. And I think Mm -hmm. the primary driver of it is just getting rid of that urge to binge. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it it totally does. It totally does. And I know in the context of alcohol, for example, you know, a lot of people and myself included would say, you know, I drink because a, it, it it does all these things for me, right? It relaxes me. It makes me sleep. It makes me fun. Um, I, I I like the way it tastes. But then when you really break it down and, you see what alcohol actually does, the consequences of it. If you have a, you know, a drinking problem, Mm -hmm. it's not worth it. It's not being funny. It's not worth being funny for. It's not worth whatever as far as, you know, relaxing you because you're really just creating more problems. Yeah. Um, And so I don't know how does, because you read the, in Rational Recovery, you said that was basically an alcohol-based book. Like how does the urge 
and, and I know this isn't your area of expertise, but just to kind of cross over, how does the urge in drinking kind of parallel the urge in eating? Is it the same? It's just the urge, the same thing? I mean, I've never struggled with alcoholism, but I could see that it definitely could be the same. I mean, I've had people tell me they've used these concepts to conquer, mm-hmm. conquer, conquer, uh, can't talk, conquer alcoholism um, because, yeah, it's, you could see it the same way. The urge to yeah. drink causes drinking, and that's what Jack Trimpey said in Rational Recovery. I forgot the exact phrasing. Oh, he, he used you cope, you drink to cope with not drinking, and it yes, yes. makes a lot of sense. Like, it's just... Um, if if it was only about being funny or relaxing, you could find so many other ways to be funny and relax. But right. anyone who's ever struggled with addiction know that other things don't work because other things don't relieve the urge. Like mm-hmm. when I was a binge eater, I'd have urges to binge and my therapist would say, okay, well, if it's about, it's about needing to relax. So take a warm bath. You take a warm bath and it does nothing because it doesn't <laughs> get rid of the urge. So it's really right. about relieving that urge is the primary driver of it. So once you kind of start to see that and... You know, so people say, well, you expect me to just let the urge be there. It's unnerving. Well, that's kind of what my approach is about is helping you be able to be with the urge and more accepting of it and and writing it out in a more peaceful way. I mean, this kind of white knuckling through it and just using pure willpower and trying to distract yourself. And, you know, that's not those strategies might work for a little while, but that's not going to be a kind of a long term fix it's it's yeah. more about coexisting with the urges in a more peaceful way and then realizing that they do go away like once you stop acting on it all of us know this kind of at, a, at an intuitive level but pretty much everyone has probably broken a habit at some time in your life to think of something you used to do that you have absolutely no desire to do anymore because it does go away once you stop acting right. on the urges so the urge at, you like sit with it like in yoga class <laughs> <laughs> there's your urge and you're just going to sit with it. So how, what are some of the tools that led you or what are some of the tools that you use to sit with the urge? Like how, how do you learn to sit with it until it passes? And then how, how long does, do you have to kind of remind yourself to do that before, you know, you said you're, you're recovered and you know, you will never go back. Like mm-hmm. what, how long did it take you for that certainty to kick in? Um, I mean, I started writing the book about six months after, and that's even before my urges fully went away. I mean, I feel like it took my urges about nine months to go away fully. Um, And that doesn't mean it was like a struggle for nine months at all. I mean, within the first few weeks, they decreased a lot. Within the first few months, I felt like it was effortless. I mean, by the time six months came along, it was kind of just random thoughts here and there, just kind of old remnants of urges. And then by nine months, it was like maybe a thought like, once every two weeks or something I don't know mm-hmm. it's hard to remember back that far but um yeah I well, mean, it's the children that made you forget <laughs> I think it was <laughs> they made me forget everything I don't know it's true. <laughs> so yeah that's how long it took and then your question was oh oh like how long do you have to sit with the urge or how do you yeah. sit with the urge okay well first of all I don't really think you have to sit with it I mean you certainly can if that's helpful like to just observe um kind of, I call it like still observation in my, in my book just to to, to sit down and watch it, like really feel being the observer, notice the sensations while all, while also not taking them seriously and not giving them meaning and not giving them power. Like that can be pro- totally fine, but it's also fine to just go about doing what you were doing before the urge. I mean, you can have an activity to go to, like you can have a list of things to do, but you don't have to, like because the activities that you do are not meant to take away the urge. That's what I think traditional therapy taught me, what, which, which was frustrating because I'd be like, I'm doing something else and the urge is not going away. That's not the point. The point is only just to, to do something else while the urge is there, while the urge passes. So the point of like having alternative activities to do is just to have you know, something to pass the time, really. Um, urges can last. They're different for everyone. You know, for some people, they can last seconds. For some people, they can last hours. So it kind of becomes about not really caring whether they're there or not like people are like well it's been there for like three hours it's not going away well okay you're still living your life you're still able to Mm -hmm. do what you need to do like go you know to your work do this but also with binging I think it's important to realize that if the urges are there for so long and they're unrelenting it could be a matter of not eating enough like in my approach there's learning to be real hunger right yeah like (laughs) actually you need to eat (laughs) Um, right so um there's dismissing the urges to binge. That's my first recovery goal. And dismissing is kind of a 
a term that's, I used to use the word resisting, but I found that that was like, you're not trying to resist. You're not trying to fight. You're trying to just give it no meaning. Like when you right. dismiss your alarm, when you don't want to wake up, it's just like, I don't need that. It's not, doesn't have value to me. So that's what <laughs> dismissing means. And then my second goal in my recovery approach is to eat adequately. And I use the word adequately because like, I don't think you need to eat perfectly. I don't think you need to eat healthy all the time. I don't think you need to eat in any certain way. You just need to eat enough food and kind of enough decent food. Like it doesn't have to be all organic or whatever. So um, those two work together. Like if you're trying to dismiss the urges to binge and you're not eating enough, you're on like a low calorie diet or whatever, it's not going to work. Your urges are going to be strong. They're going to be much harder to resist. So you have to eat enough food. So like if people are saying the urges are lasting forever, they're lasting all day and they're coming back the next day, well, you might need to look at your eating and really increase the amount of calories you're getting every day. So that can be like a piece of it as well. Mm -hmm. So where do you fall on the idea of trigger foods? I mean, where, where it, I always think I, there's no way I'm a moderator. Like I cannot have a single scoop of ice cream and go about my day. But this mm -hmm. may be because when I eat ice cream, then I get the binge urge mm -hmm. because that's what I traditionally have binged on. Yeah. Or I don't know. It's a, it's a tough question. I think that everyone is a little different. I personally, personally believe that it's the most helpful, if you can, to try to learn to eat most foods in moderation. I know that some people can't because like medical reasons or things like that, but I think it is very helpful to be able to feel like you have the power to eat any type of food without it leading to a binge. But mm -hmm. as far as like the timeline that that happens for everyone is very different. Like I just finished a eight week group course on this and like some people decided to put aside certain foods for now. Like, okay, these foods are just too hard for me when the urge comes up. It's, I can't really separate myself from it. So I'm going to just wait until I have some more confidence, you know, eating foods that are a little less triggering. And that's totally fine. Like, I don't think yeah. you, ha like some people think, okay, you have to be able to like legalize all foods and allow all foods in order to be recovered. Well, I don't really think that's necessary, but I also don't feel like you have to avoid them. I think that you have to find that balance that works for you, but also knowing that all a food can ever do is trigger an urge. Like a food doesn't cause a binge and it can take you a while to see that or to start to notice that you have those, that power in those moments that a food seems to hijack you. But I do think it's possible. Um, but I kind of believe in using the least restrictive eating plan possible, like to mm -hmm. allow yourself things, but, but whether or not, you know, it's okay if you feel like you can't have a box of cereal in your house right now. I mean, not you, but anyone who's listening. Yeah. That's okay. You're not doing something wrong. It's just you're taking care of yourself for now. And eventually, if you want a box of cereal in your house, you'll be able to. But just give yourself patience in that area and and just find a balance that works for you, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I feel like someday where I could go to a restaurant and have one piece of pizza and one scoop of ice cream would be an incredible day for me. Because I've made a ton of progress yeah. over the last eight years, a ton, like my, any binges now that I do have are very few and far between, and they are not even close to the caliber that I used to have. And I know, you know, we're working toward complete recovery, but that looks different for everyone for sure. And so can you talk a little bit about sort of the process that you've seen in your experience that people go through and why everyone's journey is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, some people stop binging like right away, and it's just over. And I was kind of like that. I mean, I binged a couple. Once I learned this new understanding, I binged a couple more times. But other than that, I mean, it was pretty much done. So, um, other people are not like that. And sometimes they read my book and think, "Oh, why, why don't I just stop like you did?" But everyone is so different. And I work with people who've been doing this for thirty years, and and I only did it for six years. And at the time, it felt like a huge chunk of time, and I missed all this time in my young life, but it wasn't that long in the grand scheme of right. things. So the brain, you know, develops habits and the habits get more sort of hardwired in there. Not hardwired. They're definitely still changeable, but it can take more practice, more patience, the longer you've had it. So that's one factor. An another big factor I find that gets in the way, which I've already um, alluded to before, is not eating enough. Like when people are so... Um, still into restrictive dieting and really don't want to let that go, that really gets in the way of stopping binging. So the more you can release that dieting mindset, the more, um, the easier it is to stop the binging. And then, um, 
just learning to recognize the urges too can be tricky for some people. Like they might recognize the urges in some situations and not act on them. Other situations, they still find themselves acting. And But it's just about coming to see that each binge is just, you just acted on an urge. Like it doesn't mean your whole life is a mess. It doesn't mean you need to fix everything. <laughs> it doesn't mean you're you're not doing well in other areas. So you just look at that one time, like what, what happened? What What were the kind of thoughts that I believed what what feelings did I give value like just looking at it so that next time it happens you can better separate yourself from it so you know as far as timelines of recovery I find that it does take people sometimes longer to stop binging like they might go a few weeks and binge and then go a few months and binge and it everyone is so different there Mm -hmm. um but I find that stopping binging is is a lot more clear cut than like kind of figuring out your how you're going to eat for the rest of your life. I mean, it's always changing and evolving how you're going to eat. But some people are like, okay, I've stopped binging, but, and that's wonderful and great and gives me so much more freedom. But now how do I eat? Like what, like (laughs) (laughs) it can can be like letting go of dieting. There's so many cultural messages out there about what we should be doing. and, And people still struggle with like overeating or grazing or whatever. So that's not really, I mean, I do help people with that a little bit, but my main expertise is like to stop the binging. And, but once the binging goes away, you can't expect that you're going to have a perfect way of eating and you're never going to overeat again. And you're never going to eat imperfectly again. Like I think it's very important to be able to to accept imperfection and realize you're only going for normal here. You're not going for perfect, you know? So everyone's different. That's really interesting (laughs) too, the not going for perfect thing, because I think a lot of these behaviors are maybe they start early from that sense of perfectionism. Like we need to get everything perfect and to break that sort of mindset. And something you said that was, that's super important. And I know is a big part of, of brain over binge is not giving significance or value to the urge, to those thoughts. So what is something or what is kind of the process that you have maybe trained yourself? Like what are the things you say to yourself to say, okay, that doesn't have any value. That's not true. Or this isn't important to me. I'm not going to listen to it. Or do you just kind of in the beginning say that to yourself? Like, Mm -hmm. okay, I just heard that I need to binge on this amazing chocolate check cereal, (laughs) which is what I love. Um, but I'm, I'm not, there's no value to that. I mean, is it literally some stuff in your head that you have to just repeat? Like how, Mm -hmm. what is that? I'm not going to give this value. How did, how do you get there? Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't even think you need to say anything to yourself in the moment. It almost like, if you try in the moment to argue back with the thoughts or say these thoughts have no value or whatever, a lot of times you just get another thought back to argue it and it ends up being this big fight in your head. So it's almost like learning to just notice the thought and that's it. Like, just notice it. And mm-hmm. and you you I think you have to have that sort of deep understanding of what it is and where it's coming from and that it is not you, that it's lower brain. And and all that kind of comes maybe when you're not having urges, like by reading a book or by, um, I'm releasing these coaching audios pretty soon. Um, I have my own podcast called the brain over binge podcast and I'll announce it there as well. But like setting up yourself for success in the moments outside of the binging and that, you know, yeah. like I said, with the book and audios or anything that helps you kind of develop that understanding. So then when the moment comes, you don't even need to argue back. It's just, right. you have the thought and you don't need to do anything. It, you just, yeah. you don't act, you, but you don't have to try to convince yourself in the moment that it has no value. Because in that moment, you are going to still feel that wanting. You are still going to feel that desire. And it's a matter of like realizing, okay, yeah, temporarily right now I do feel that way and not trying to deny your experience. That is your experience, but it doesn't mean it has to lead lead you into harmful action. Yeah. There's a lot of value in feeding your brain (laughs) good, good audio and, and good, you know, reading good books during this time. I know, um, when I was decided to quit drinking, I, I had a I ended that just like you ended binging. Like I just was done with it. And mm-hmm. um, I'm able to, you know, walk by a bar, sit at a bar with people. It's no problem whatsoever because, and, and like you say, you just kind of let it, let those urges pass. And that's exactly what I do with booze. It's, it's just so easy. Now food is diff- is more difficult for me for whatever reason. I guess you, you mentioned, you know, a lot of people have those struggles for longer and it takes longer to kind of get past it. And I, I feel like that's, that's where I'm at. 
Because it's been a long time. And you have to eat. Like, that's what makes it. You can't yeah. just quit eating. I mean, that's right. what makes it a little different than a lot of other habits that you can just quit. Like, you cannot quit eating. So, yeah. yeah it's I wish about... I had, like, sometimes I wish I just had, like, a, you know, a, an IV. <laughs> <laughs> like, can I just get a doctor to give me an IV and get all my nutrients through there and then I'll be done with this? <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about your audio coaching. Um, what, what's going on with that? It's just something new that I'm putting out there. It's actually a part of, I have a brain over binge independent study course and a brain over binge eight week group course. And one is like, you do the lessons on your own. And the other is with me, like with calls every week. And I just finished that up and I won't start that again until February. But anyway, as a part of these courses, there's coaching audios, which you listen to every day. They're like five to seven minutes. There's 14 of them. And you can kind of listen to them over and over just about connecting with your motivations to quit binging, to reinforce these concepts like of the lower brain and the higher brain and the fact that the urges have no meaning and just kind of developing that deeper understanding. So I'm releasing the coaching audios separately um, probably by the end of this month. Um, I've already released them to like people who are on the waiting list. But if you go to, on my podcast or my website, brainoverbinge.com, I'll be putting information there pretty shortly about when it's available. I also have a free ebook. I think you said you'd link to that. If yeah. you get my free ebook, uh, you also get in my newsletter, um, email list, and you can get notifications as far as like, you know, anything I have new coming up. Awesome. Awesome. So I've got one more question for you. Okay. Um, this podcast is called The Same 24 Hours, and it was born out of the idea that we all have the same 24 hours in our day. But it's what we do with those 24 hours that makes our lives the best they can be. So what is something that you do on a daily basis that you think has really, really set you up for success? Um, I think, okay, maybe I'll do two things. Okay. <laughs> as far as like using those 24 hours to the best of my ability, and this kind of relates to the topic of eating, it's like I've given up all the dieting. Like I don't get into that world of like what should be eaten and what... Like, I think women spend so much energy, and men too, like figuring out what you're going to eat, spending so much time on your body and like what certain body parts look like and how much you weigh. Like, I don't weigh myself. I, I just think putting aside that whole struggle and staying out of that world just opens up a massive amount of time in your life. And that doesn't mean I'm unhealthy. Like, I still like to eat healthy. I still like to exercise. But it's just not um, so consuming. So I yes, think... Yes, I would love to get there. Yeah. I would... Because I... I mean, I spend probably 80% of my day thinking about food, what yeah. I'm eating, what I'm counting, you know, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to get past it. Yeah. And it's definitely a process that's different for everyone. But I mean, yeah. if you can gradually start to let that go, it, it does, it opens up a whole, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I've ever counted anything I put in my mouth. I mean, it's probably been 10 years or something. So wow. it's, it's really nice. And I just want to encourage women who are, I don't even understand how it's done, like with having four kids and like, I can't imagine <laughs> counting. I mean, I'm, I don't know, eating their leftover chicken nuggets. I don't know. I'm yeah. not counting anything. So you're too busy counting kids. What kid? One, two, <laughs> like, three, four. They? <laughs> um, and yeah, I think so, I was going to say too, as far as like writing my book during such a busy time and like with my kids being so young and not sleeping very much, I just kind of kept going back to it. And like, even if you feel like you're in a time in your life where you don't have time and like things are so overwhelming, just any amount of time you can spend, if you have a goal, just like keep going back to it, keep doing it. Never, mm -hmm. never just put it on the, put it on the shelf. Like I said, it took about six years for me to write this book only because I never gave up. And that sounds maybe cliche, but just keep doing it in whatever way you can and never know what could come out of it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So I want to go back real quick um, to the idea of getting rid of dieting, getting rid of counting, Okay, all of that. That is so foreign to me. I know it shouldn't be, but it is because I'm terrified of what happens if I actually do that. And I know mm -hmm. I'm not the first person that you've worked with <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that, that also says that. So how do we release that fear? I think, gosh, I do think it's something that the fear doesn't really go away until after you've done it, I think. And you've seen mm -hmm. that nothing terrible happens. Like I think it's <laughs> the world. didn't end. Yeah. It's almost like, um, giving it up in spite of the fear, knowing that the fear is normal, knowing that this is kind of uncharted territory. And, and also just, I don't know. I think that I guess seeing a lot of th weight, weight science is kind of interesting and I, I can't say I'm an expert on it, but you know, 
the, all this control a lot of times leads to more of a lack of control and like trying to manage everything actually leads to you eating not you but people eating mm-hmm. more than they would if they just you know gave that that up like I try to tell people all the time they're like I can't give up restricting I'm like but your restricting is leading to binging and that is so many more calories than just eating a normal diet every day I mean my my binging my restricting plus binging was like I mean I I don't even know the math on it but ridiculous amounts of then I was so scared to like eat 2,000 calories a day or more like I I would never even consider that and but (laughs) yet my binging plus my restricting was probably like 7,000 calories a day so like just seeing the reality of it that eating a normal amount of food every day is actually going to probably be less than what you're doing now with all the control. <laughs> so and not, I'm not saying you. I just use the word you no, in general. No, you can say I don't you. It's okay. <laughs> exactly <laughs> what your, you know, what your habits are, but I don't know. It, it's very freeing. I I don't know if you've heard of um I'll give a shout out to Paige um, Smathers on the Nutrition Matters podcast. I love her oh, work. Yeah. Have you ever heard oh, no, of her? I haven't. I've heard, I know the name, but I don't know her work. I just think her, um, it's it's helpful just to, to get involved in hearing other perspectives. I think a lot of people just hear this fitness, health perspective, and, and it's good to hear kind of a weight neutral perspective on health. And, and not that she doesn't promote health, but does it from a, a place of like, yeah, a healthy body is going to be the weight that it's going to be. It's going to be your natural weight, like whatever that is. And it doesn't mean you just eat whatever, whenever. It just means you accept your natural, natural um, version of yourself, a natural healthy mm-hmm. version of yourself. I think people think that giving up that stuff automatically means you'll blow up and be 500 pounds or whatever, but it, it's not. Like just seeing that your weight will remain stable if you learn to kind of get in touch with your body signals and and honor your body and respect your body, your, your weight stays remarkably the same. I and mean, mine has weight has been the same for years and years and years and years. It doesn't change. I don't weigh myself, but every time I do get weighed and in it, I weigh myself like, you know, every now and then it's not like I don't ever. Um, it doesn't change because mm. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, and not <laughs> that it just, it's amazing to me because I thought, I always thought growing, growing up, I got the message that one day I would have to start controlling it. Like, when I was younger right. and thin, people, adults in my life would say, okay, but, but you're going to gain weight eventually. And then when it started happening, it was like freaking me out. But, but it would have stopped. Like it would have, I would have got to my natural healthy weight and I, you know, and it stays there. Like, I don't know if I'm doing a good job explaining this, but no, no, I think no, that I yeah. thought that my job needed to be to control my weight. I, I don't think that way anymore. People think that they have to manage their weight, but your weight, your body like manages so many things. Think of your heart and your breathing and all these processes that go on and your weight is also very, very, very complex. So thinking we can control it, it's, it's kind of a losing battle. So like just letting go and realizing that your body's, it's got that your body can control that. Um, you know, it takes, it takes some getting used to, but it is freeing, I think. And I would definitely recommend Paige's podcast, Nutrition Matters, um, for more on that because I'm not an expert on like weight and stuff. <laughs> I'm just trying to stay focused on helping people stop binging and then, right. you know, refer them elsewhere to like helping with their eating and their weight and stuff like that. Got it. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. I'll post up the links to everything you've got going on, but I appreciate your book and it definitely brought some big awareness for me and I know it will for other people too. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you so much, Meredith. I appreciate you having me.